Okay, then uh, I would say let's start. Uh, welcome to everyone to join us for our webinar today. We are super excited to introduce uh, our new our newest actually crops to feature today, which is based on artificial intelligence, uh, namely the roast curve prediction, uh, which is part of the roasting intelligence now. So my name is Lisa and I am working as product manager for Crops to Roast. Uh, and I'm here today with our CTO, Martin, um, and Katie from Mission Coffee to, I, <laughs> to to talk about this new feature. So um, welcome again, and thank you both for joining me today. Uh, within the next 20 to 30 minutes, we will give you an overview about what the curve prediction actually is, how it will look during roasting. Uh, we will talk a little bit with Katie about her experiences during beta testing. And then at the end, we'll also talk about what actually artificial intelligence is. So we will dig a little bit deeper into the technical side of things. Um, after we like, have wrapped this up, uh, we will uh, open up the session for a Q&A, so question and answers. So if you already have a question during the webinar, please feel free to post it into the chat and we will go into the chat at the end of our webinar and look at the questions and answer them as best as possible. Yeah, so thanks Lisa. Uh, also welcome Katie and welcome also from my side. Uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Martin. I'm one of the co-founders of Cropster and its chief technology officer. Uh, and for over a decade now, we at Cropster work on technologies to help push the specialty industry forward. Uh, but seldomly was I as excited as I am today uh, to show you what we have been working on. And this really is charting a new course for innovative products to cover. Without further ado, let's jump straight into today's session. Uh, Lisa, please tell us all the curve prediction. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, so basically the new you feed you to or, the, or helps you to see where your roast will be going. So with this new feature, you will be able to see where your bean temperature curves, but also your rate of rise curves will progress within the next two minutes of your roast. And with this, this, with this new information, you will be now able to uh, make adjustments, for example, gas adjustments, uh, to keep your roast actually closer to your reference curve. So this should lead to more consistent roasts, uh, but also should help you to create uh, new uh, recipes, for example, new profiles, uh, but also train new staff members. Um, the craft prediction itself, it's based on artificial intelligence, as I said before, uh, and we used uh, basically a method of artificial intelligence called machine learning. More about that later with Martin. Um, <laughs> the curve prediction in, uh, in both in bean temperature and the rate of rise uh, will both show up 60 seconds uh, into the roast. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm sure everyone now is curious of what it actually looks like when someone is working with the roasting intelligence. And uh, I think we have a demo prepared. Yes, we do. Um, so I'm excited to show you the demo. Uh, we actually, for everybody who hasn't uh, read the newsletter yet or have, hasn't seen it, we actually have launched a feature last week, Tuesday. Uh, um, so since available in the roasting intelligence. Uh, but before we launched it, we also beta tested the feature for quite some months uh, with our beta testing program. Um, I will now share my screen so you can see the roasting intelligence. Okay. So, uh, Martin and Katie, can you confirm that you can see the roasting intelligence? Yes. Mm. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so as you can see with the new version, uh, we also inform, uh, we inform you about the new feature right on top. Uh, if you haven't enabled the new feature yet, you can do it right from this info message. There would be a button. Uh, in my case, it isn't because I have already enabled it. Um, so I will now start the roast. And you see here, I'm not hooked up to a roasting machine at the moment, <laughs> but I have a demo roast running. Um, so when I hit start, uh, it starts now. This is still familiar probably to you. It looks the same because I said before, we need to wait 60 seconds into the roast until the curve prediction shows up. Depending on your machine, this is shortly before or, or shortly after the turning point. 
uh, the prediction itself will show up as a dashed line in the same color that your beam temperature is. So in my case, for example, it will show up in a dashed blue line uh, for the beam temperature and also for the beam temperature rate of rise. And then also in the background uh, of the prediction, you will see like a light blue rectangle that will give you a really good indication of the predicted time frame itself. So we have a few minutes left, a few seconds left actually. Um, the prediction itself updates every second. So every second uh, we look if something has changed and update the prediction. So it's uh, most accurate. Um, yeah. So as you can see, it started now 60 seconds into the roast. Um, and if you have a machine that we can actually uh, read gas out from automatically, we also take each gas change immediately into account. As we update the prediction every second, we will send the new gas value as well and then um, basically update it with the new gas value. Um, so you can see now how, how this progresses here. For example, in this case, I'm a little bit um, above my reference roast and I could adjust my gas at this moment if I want to um, get it a little bit lower. Um, let's talk a little bit about accuracy. Uh, at the moment, we are, with the two minutes of prediction, we are within one degree Celsius of accuracy. Uh, and actually, 30 seconds into the prediction, we are within 0 0.5 degrees Celsius and 0 0.9 degrees Fahrenheit of accuracy. Um, so we are actually quite accurate at the moment, even so accurate that, is, um, that the error of the thermocouple uh, is higher than actually our prediction error. Um, yeah, so basically that is the prediction, that is, how it, that is how it looks like. So with this information, you can now basically see into the future uh, and make change, uh, changes to your Roast based on that. Ah, nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, well, one thing we, we always talk about uh, here at the Prop Store uh, is the importance of verifying assumptions while we build something, uh, something new that hasn't been tested before, uh, and before we even launch it to the public. And for that, we rely on the trusted feedback of our beta customers and beta testers. Uh, and you mentioned that we have um, tested this feature now for several months and I'm sure the audience is interested to hear some uh, hands-on experience from Katie who was so kind to also be part of our of our beta testing group. Yes, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited again as well uh, to have you here Katie. Um, Katie, you're here uh, with us from Mission Coffee. Uh, but I think the best is if you can give us a little bit on, on your background, on your position, how you currently use Cropster, these kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am based out of a really small micro roastery here in Columbus, Ohio. It's called Mission Coffee Company. And I had been a barista with them for a while. And I was looking for that edge into the other side or the another side of coffee getting into roasting and green sourcing. And an opportunity presented itself. So I quit my project management job and started roasting full time here with Mission back last September or so. So Cropster has been incredibly useful to help me learn the craft of roasting. My first day as a roaster, I did not think I'd be roasting coffee at all, but due to Cropster being just available in our company, having a nice relationship with Cropster, I roasted 15 batches my first day of ro roasting coffee. All right, because we had that, um, the recipe and the roast curve available and my director of roasting operations just said follow the recipe make sure the lines li line up and kind of everything took off from there so now roasting for some time now getting close to a year which is really cool to think about and getting into green sourcing and being part of the beta testing group everything that crosser has to offer has really helped me hone in these skills and just had me feel a lot more confident about what i'm doing being kind of new in this so I really, it's been a really cool um, relationship to have and work through and meet everyone through Cropster and just it's made me definitely a better roaster coming from no experience at all. So it's really great. <laughs> wow, <laughs> thank you so much. And well, congratulations <laughs> to your soon first year anniversary. Yeah. That is- Yeah, is... yeah, we can have a little free celebration. <laughs> yes, that, that is pretty amazing. 
Um, that's really cool. Uh, thanks again for all your great feedback during this phase because, I mean, it meant a lot to us and really helped us to improve it. Um, and uh, as I said, you started using the Bean Curve prediction and I think it was around the January uh, or, or joined our beta testing. So could you tell us a little bit when you started it, um, how was the experience with the new feature? What did change for you during roasting when we, when we added the feature? Yeah, so it was really interesting to start seeing these prediction lines appear um, as I'm trying to absorb and understand all the reactions that airflow, temperature control, those together, those at separate times, during development, during the mayor stage, all those things is a lot to take in. Um, and through our roasted time is around 12 to 13 minutes. It's a very intense 12 to 13 minutes there. I'm trying to think about all the variables that I'm in control of and their effect that it would have on that roast. So with these bean prediction curves, any kind of tweak or change I made was really just demonstrated in just a few seconds by that prediction curve adapting to what I just did. So it really helped paint a picture of connection through if I change airflow at this point in the roast, what does that mean towards the end of the roast? And especially with turning points and like the drying time, ours is a little longer um, because our beans tend to be a little bit more moist um, <laughs> than others we've found and come to find out. So on our um, roasting operations, that prediction tends to happen right as we're reaching turning point. So that just paints an incredible picture for me going into that first rate of rise, giant curve, and it really sets everything up. So pretty much it just helped make a big connection to all the theories of roasting coffee and seeing them practically applied to roast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is really cool. Uh, so you said that, um, that the prediction itself is very useful for, do, for you right after the turning point. So is this also where you yeah. would say that this is the phase where at the moment it's most useful for you or which parts you're mostly interested in? I would in? say it's a tie between the drying stage at that turning point and then getting into the development stage because those are just two very important aspects of the roast. Everything's very important. Um, but with that turning point and setting that up, it really just paints like, all right, my charge temp was okay, or maybe it was a little too hot. Um, especially with the temperature curve and the rate of rise together, you can, if the temperature is going too hot and your rate of rise, you know, is coming a little too low, you can start thinking about how to tweak those things to get it to where you want to be. So that turning point, and as you get to the development stage, that's where the beans can really just start to have a mind of their own between the endo and exothermic processes that occur. So it really helps just stay in control as much as you can with those elements. And as I got used to the beta testing and that um, stage of roasting, now towards you know getting to this year, I feel a lot more in control than I did those first couple months at that um, development stage. <laughs> <laughs> that is great to hear. But yeah, the development stage is for sure like one of the most important yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's really cool to see um, the temperature and the rate of rise projected past your end of roast time too. It kind of helps, you know, throw it out there. My director of roasting operations, Christian said, think of all your movements like you're driving a big boat and you got to kind of take them slow and take them big. So with those predicts, paint, you know, those lines that are going on. Pretty cool analogy. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cool. So you, you said you're using it in drying phase and in the development phase, but also post roast. Uh, would you say you use it both for production roast and creating a new profile in the same way or? So it's definitely used even throughout our sample roasting. Um, so the main aspects of roasting that we do are production roasting. Um, that would be anywhere from 50 to 100 nine pound batches per week. We're kind of a smaller scale operation here in Columbus. Then we'll do sample roasting usually every Thursday sample roast so we can have a fun cupping Friday. Um, and we'll use the prediction curves on those as well, because as we are sample roasting or as we're getting new green beans in and we're kind of learning about them, we kind of let the first roast or so that we have just ride. You know, we don't have necessarily a set profile. We like to see what the beans are, are doing and how they're reacting to certain things. So with those prediction curves, it really helps paint like that picture going forward. I think in the past couple months, we've introduced maybe three or four different green lots that we previously had not used before within this company. So it was fun just to, you know, let it drop, kind of put it at a soft temperature and see where those prediction lines kind of put us at. I think it's very useful in honing in roasts, especially as my beginning roaster days as well. It's just nice to see everything really laid out. Cool. 
That sounds really good. Uh, and do, do you feel like using it on a sample machine, but also on a production machine, do you feel the prediction lines are accurate? I do, yeah. And I think they're, they're pretty accurate and they're very reactive too. So both of those things together um, result in me being able to trust those prediction lines um, and really just know that that's what's going to go on until I make the next little tweak to the roast. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit for our participants, also for a better context. Uh, which roasting machines do you uh, are you using for like sample roasting? Yeah, so for our production roast, we use a U.S. Roaster Core. Uh, we do nine pound batches, mm -hmm. um, and we usually charge anywhere from. It's been really hot here in Ohio. Um, we're on Fahrenheit, so I don't want to say a whole bunch of random Fahrenheit numbers to everyone. But it's very hot, and so our charge temp is a lot lower. Um, then our sample roast, we have a couple of different machines that we do. We use like a little tiny B more. I don't remember the brand of this one that we use. It's kind of like old school that we've just kind of had in our little mission family for a while. It's like our little old faithful. <laughs> so we kind of play around within those two. Um, I love the company that I work for because there's a lot of room to play. So we play a lot with different roasts. And so being a part of this beta testing group, already being playful people, it's just really <laughs> cool to have. At one point, I hooked up an old popcorn making machine and roasted coffee on there. And I wish I could have connected Crafter just to see, you know, like <laughs> what crazy numbers it would have given me. <laughs> I would wish to see the prediction line on a popcorn machine. That would be <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> thrift store too. It's, it's a lot of fun. So yeah. I would say amongst all the weird roasts and all the fun little games and science things we do, Crafter is definitely accurate and plays an important role in all those little machines that we hooked up and the bigger machines too. <laughs> that, that, is, that is pretty cool. Um, and I think it's a good uh, add-on also for our participants. It, the, the prediction itself at the moment, or not even at the moment, but from the start, it doesn't matter which machine you're using, you can use it with any machine. So that is pretty nice. Yeah. Um, I think I, I had one, one last question for you, Katie. Uh, you were beta testing for us quite some time and at the beginning um, also for our beta testers our prediction was not updating so fast right and we added a few things uh, like at the end uh, first of all we updated the prediction to change in in, in, the, in a one second update basically and also we added the rate of rise prediction to it uh, how does it work for you like the rate of rise prediction did it did it improve did it help yeah, I think the time the rate of rise prediction rolled around and we were executing it, the responsiveness was definitely a lot better um, than like the first um, download I got of the beta <laughs> test um, group for sure. And then once that came out in combination with the bean temperature, it was just amazing to see those two things laid out um, and see them go. And I played around with the different resolutions as well. And at the beginning, you know, it was beta testing and it still wasn't terrible. And I used to use an old wonky, terrible little PC. And once I switched to this Mac, um, the lines were going really zigzag in this old computer I was using. They became very straight and fluid. So that was definitely more of a reflection of my very old computer, <laughs> like desktop that we were using. Um, but no, now that things are kind of set and everything's launched, it's really cool. Um, an addition that I liked from the first kind of rounds of the beta test was that little grayed out bar um, that moves along with that prediction um, area. And that's really cool. Say if you're multitasking, you can kind of look and see that, that bar and see what you're doing and see how it's laid out. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. Um, I mean, I would, we will move on to Martin uh, with the artificial intelligence. But before we do that, I just like want to ask you one last question, which is, what are you most excited about doing at Mission Coffee for the next year? Ooh, oh my gosh, the next year. So the past few weeks, uh, our director has getting me into green sourcing, which is really fun. I have Colombian family and I speak Spanish fluently. So being able to use those skills for my job, which doesn't feel like a job, is just becoming incredible talking with different importers, exporters, producers, local roasteries, and and different farmer connections that uh, our director Christian brought over. It's just so exciting to start to learn all those terms and all the contracts and even all the boring stuff. Um, so because of that, there's two of our heads towards this green sourcing and we're gonna have some really crazy cool beans coming out. And we're playing around with different roast styles, keeping things really light and long with a really flat rate of rise and seeing how that transfers. So yeah, again, we're just very playful over here. So there's a lot going on all the time. <laughs> That's really, it all sounds really exciting. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. If we if we have the feature for green sourcing and better testing, I already know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll be down. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. And for our participants, if you have a question to Katie, please just put it into the chat, and we will get to it uh, at the end of our session. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, Katie, again, and. I said we're happy uh, that we can include our customers into this beta testing because it, it allows us to improve and even launch it. Um, so in this case, we, we had a really, really long beta testing phase, but mostly the first artificial intelligence feature. Um, so now it's the time to dig a little bit deeper, deeper and talk a little bit about what is actually artificial intelligence? Um, how did we all create this? So, Martin, my question: yeah. uh, Can you elaborate a bit on? Okay, I, I shall do. I mean, it's like uh, what what Katie said. And like, I mean, what the, the results are, are visible, but I mean, we all heard hear a lot about the term. Uh, so, about artificial intelligence, machine learning. So, on a high level, artificial intelligence is the ability of machines to observe, think, and react like human beings. Uh, it's, it's based on the idea that the human intelligence can be broken down into precise abilities, which computers can be programmed to mimic. Um, so AI is more of an umbrella term uh, that encompasses more uh, concept and technologies like machine learning that we briefly touched. Uh, so machine learning focus, focuses on teaching computers how to learn without the need to be programmed for a specific task. Uh, so, in fact, the key idea behind machine learning is that it is possible to create an algorithm, like the prediction, that learns from and makes predictions solely based on data. Um, and, and in order to, to teach a, a machine, uh, we have roughly three components. <laughs> I mean, there's way more uh, behind, but the, the components are like you need a data set, which is a collection of samples that we use to train the machine. Uh, then we have features. Uh, those are important pieces uh, of the data that work as the key to the solution of the task. So demonstrate the machine uh, what to pay attention to. Um, for example, in, in our case, it's like the machine you are roasting on. Um, and then there's algorithms and there is different kinds of algorithms uh, for this. One can even use different algorithms to, to solve the same task. Uh, but depending on the algorithm you choose, uh, the accuracy or speed uh, of getting the results can be different. So it's important to point out that machine learning is more independent than if we would manually encode instructions, say like do X after Y uh, for, for performing a task. Uh, so the, the system itself can recognize patterns uh, and make the variable prediction on its own. Um, so if the, we, we could say that if the quality of the data set is high and features were chosen right, a machine learning system can become better at the task than a human. Uh, that has been demonstrated a couple of times, uh, not only in games like uh, chess or go, uh, but that said, we cannot stress enough that the fact that while the system can be developed, uh, can develop on parallel precision for a certain task, we are not going to take away the skilled workers anytime soon. Uh, artificial intelligence is not a threat. It's a tool, uh, like a color meter in your roastery. Uh, it helps you to augment human abilities. Uh, so we can focus on the important things and do our, our jobs better. I think that this <laughs> roughly. Thank, thanks, Martin. Like, I think there was a really good introduction of of the concept uh, behind artificial intelligence, especially like the comparison, how you can, how it is like learning, like a human does. Uh, now let's get a little bit in depth and talk about what exactly we at Cropster actually implement. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty here. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Um, so, Lisa, you let me know when you see my screen. Yes, I see your screen. Okay, so we are using a specific class of machine learning, <laughs> and this is called deep learning. Uh, this technology not only powers our prediction, but is uh, used in many other applications that are commonplace nowadays, uh, like voice or driving assistance. Um, 
to place it in context with the terms that we used before, you can imagine it like a Russian nesting doll. Um, so the outer layer would be the term artificial intelligence. Then we have machine learning. And then we have deep learning. Um, and in deep learning, uh, we use <laughs> neural networks. <laughs> So those are algorithms that are inspired by the human brain uh, to learn from a large uh, data set. So those are composed of like different layers uh, whereby each layer is made out of a node of several nodes. And those nodes are more like a human neuron. Uh, so they, they, are, they are doing some computation. Um, what does it mean? Uh, so we can show it for example, a picture um, and feed this into the system. And those nodes, uh, they will activate if they get enough stimuli. Uh, so all those connections that we have, they all have like adjustable weights, uh, which can be tweaked. And in the combination with like which node fired <laughs> or activated and combined with the nodes, uh, it becomes highly flexible and it enables the algorithm to, to actually learn by repeatedly seeing things and then uh, going on. Well, for example, uh, in, in this important case here, uh, it, it could like, uh, the input would be telling a part, for example, what is a dog hair or what is cotton? Um, and based on these results, these signals will just travel around uh, going through the network and they will affect the ultimate outcome. Again, in this case, it would answer the age old question if it's a dog or a mop. Uh, so, you know, those are the really important things that computer scientists are, are, are taking uh, serious. Uh, uh, but all, all kidding aside, um, what. So, let me just switch back. Um, so, what can be said is like um, that deep learning algorithms learn to recognize correlations between certain relevant features uh, and the optimal results and so draw conclusions between feature signals and what those feature represent. Um, this makes them very flexible uh, in, in the way that they can learn, uh, as we said, from enough data and but the outcome, although all, all this flexibility, uh, they will still only perform a certain very specific task that we train it on. So uh, in other words, if you take a Tesla, um, a Tesla packs a lot of smarts, but it won't be able to operate the roasting machine, um, nor, nor will ours uh, be able to drive it home. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Martin, for the summary. I know it's a complex topic, but I, I really like the Tesla comparison. Um, so I tried to summarize this a little bit. So we could say that um, basically the prediction, it learns like we as human learn from experience, right? So basically you repeatedly perform a task and every time you perform the task, you tweak it just a little bit and you get better in it. Right, so it's basically like progressively learning a skill. Yeah, exactly. Um, and in our case, we, we trained it on understanding the dynamics in, a, uh, in, in the roasting process. Uh, so we know from experience, for example, that, that roast machine, I mean, as, as Katie can, can say, it's like it's different what, what you are roasting on. Um, and it's not even only the manufacturer, but it's also like, the size and those are the manufacturing dates. Um, and we therefore made it our priority to build a system that works across those differences. Uh, we focused our efforts on, on measurements that, and, and, and data that is readily available to customers. And in order to bring the benefits of this technology to everyone who uses roasting intelligence today. Thanks, Martin. Um, I think that sounds fantastic. Um, uh, as said, the, this type of technology ins, is inspired by the human brain, more or less, I would say. Um, so like a human uh, brain itself, also technology 
needs to learn about the specific task in the first place, right? So how did we at Cropster learn about this specific task? Good question. Uh, so, so about two years ago, uh, roughly, uh, we started uh, a, a project called the Data Project. And we had the goal in mind to find new relationships within roasting data and using this knowledge to, uh, to help roasters and the greater coffee community. Uh, after we launched the project, we contacted some of our customers uh, in order to see if they were open to participate in research projects. And while we hoped for the best, uh, we were floored by the positive feedback we had received. Uh, many of our, our friends and customers were interested, gave us the permission to analyze their of this data project. So in a sense, the data project serves as an incubator uh, and test bed for new and innovative ideas uh, that we explore together with our customers. Um, the curve prediction originated in the data project uh, and its benefits can now be made available to the wider community. So. I think that's that's a success. Thanks, Martin. Uh, maybe also for our participants, uh, interesting, if you're interested to learn more about the data project or join the data project, you can just go on our website and search for data project and you will get all the information uh, you need. So uh, I think, last question, Martin. Uh, uh, again, let's go back to the comparison to the human brain. So my question is, does the feature also still get smarter? Uh, the short answer, yes. Uh, although, as you said, Lisa, um, we already reached a point uh, where we are like in dot five degrees Celsius, dot nine degree Fahrenheit, which is like uh, on par with the measurement error of a bean temperature probe. Uh, our data scientist team uh, works hard on further tuning the algorithm and incorporating more findings and knowledge that we get, the more people use and the that we get from uh, from customers that, that help us find and, and, and improve the, the concept that we have. Awesome. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I think this is a good point to, to wrap this up from our side, uh, which is our data science team that you mentioned. I uh, have a team at Propster that is uh, working tirelessly to improve it, to get new ideas, to innovate on these ideas. Uh, and to go into the direction of artificial intelligence. So the release is for us at Cropster a beginning of a new era, which is really cool. I'm excited about. So now I would say uh, we jump straight into the Q&A and able to close my sidebar. Uh, I already saw that there were plenty of questions coming in um, during our talk. So uh, maybe let's start with an Easy one. <laughs> um, I, I, I start with one that I can easily answer and then I go to the next one. So the, the first one is, uh, does the prediction need a good internet connection to work? Um, so the, the short answer is yes, you need an internet connection uh, that the prediction works, mostly due to the fact that we need to update it every time uh, because uh, for the accuracy, right? We need to react immediately to any change you do, any gas change uh, or any temperature change to give you a new, uh, um, a new prediction. Uh, that said, we just today uh, released an improvement for slower internet connections so it still works with slower internet connections, you still need to have one. Um, what it means, because also we got that question previously and I want to just like go ahead of the question is uh, how much internet does it use, right? If you, have, if you are on a data plan, how much it? Uh, basically, roughly it is like uh, one, what did I say? I think one megabit for three minutes. Let me look it up. I don't want to give you the wrong numbers here. Uh, yeah, it is one megabit per three minutes roasting. So if we take uh, Katie's example about the 12 minutes roast, 12 minutes roast is about four megabyte. Um, so let's assume you roast about eight hours, four, three to four batches um, per hour. Uh, it means in a full month, you would need one gigabyte of internet, but for an eight hour roasting day. Uh, to give you a little bit of uh, perspective, because I know it's hard to think in terms like gigabyte, how much is that? 
uh, if you, for example, use Instagram for one hour per day only, you would need about three gigabytes uh, per month. And if you would, for example, stream music for one hour only per day, you would need about 1.5 gigabyte per month. Okay, I hope, Daniel, this answers your question. Um, I think this also answered one of Eric's questions. Uh, so is the feature purely cloud-based or do I need to upgrade my hardware? I guess <laughs> this is answered. Yeah, no up upgrade of your hardware needed. It's cloud-based. Well, let's stay, begin from the top. Um, let's see, does it pick up on individual roasting style over time or is it general based on collected database? Okay. Uh, um, maybe Martin, this is a question for you. Yeah, um, well, well, I, I could say, uh, does it pick up on a personal style? I mean, we, we do the prediction, um, so like based what what will going, what is going to happen in two minutes, and I it does not depend on. It's like it will predict accurately even if you change your roast style. Um, so although the, the data it it is like more. Uh, like a collective, I mean, where, where uh, it learns from, from everything it sees uh, and can, uh, or we, we train it on, um, it will still be able to also like uh, understand uh, and, and correctly predict uh, even, even if, if you, you adjust your roasting style. So, yeah. Okay. I, um, I hope it answers the question. If, if, yeah. uh, I mean, if, if not, please if not, pose please another just, question. Yeah. Uh, okay, then we have one. Is accuracy impacted by probe placement? For example, if, if you are tracking exhaust temp versus environmental temp, does it make any difference? Um, I mean, I can answer that at the moment, no. Uh, same as Martin said. I mean, at the moment, what we're taking into account is the bean temperature and the gas. So it doesn't matter because, how can I best answer that? <laughs> it doesn't matter because we tr it is trained, as Martin said, on this model that we even take this, all of that into account, right? It's not trained on the, the perfect roasting temperature where the temperature is exactly what the beans are. It is trained on the fact that people have different probe placements already. So our model is aware that probe pl pl placements can be different. It, it can take yeah. It can take this into account. I mean, if you do a really play, a really weird placement, I I I give well probably not. Um, but if you if you stay in the range of, of normal pro placements, uh, um, we have you covered. Maybe Katie, you can tell us what your pro placement is. No, yeah, I agree um, with everything y'all have said. We do uh, directly in through the front uh, environmental tent pro. We use like external thermo thermocouple for that and. It reads really accurate, accurately. We have our off, offset given to those facts. Um, they kind of like piggyback off of what you both said. It's less about where you place the probe placement, but them working in unison together and the artificial intelligence is already prepared to take on that probe and where it could potentially be. As long as it's not like way off in left field, you know, you will be able to tweak your adjustments, tweak your readings and then have it accurately reflect that bean temperature. Thank you. I hope yeah. this answers your question. And if not, please just uh, post another one. Um, okay, we have the cloud-based one. Thank you, I think you understood. So I'm just reading through the follow-up, echo crop certificates, where the time is taken. Yeah, um, uh, what Joseph said, yes. We, so, um, as we, we keep training the, the system uh, and it will uh, continuously learn from, uh, from, from other roasting styles and other, uh, other means and, and it will improve the model and it will become, uh, then, then be able to, to uh, predict your, your curve <laughs> based, based on all the information it gathers and the, the, the model we, it, it, it is trained. Okay. Okay, then I have a question. Uh, is is the does the prediction respond for uh, an air adjustment? 
uh, is will it be possible to change prediction part of bean template? Uh, I'm not 100% sure I understand the second part, but the first part about if the prediction takes the air adjustments into account. At the moment, the prediction takes the bean temperature curve that happens before the prediction plus any gas change into account if we can read out your gas automatically. That said, we haven't seen a huge impact on the airflow changes or a need to integrate them immediately. Because, I mean, Katie, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but like as Katie said before, you make an airflow change, but it most of the time has an impact later on in the roast versus a gas change usually has an immediate impact. And so if we, you make an airflow change and we get a bean temperature curve, we can already update the prediction with that versus on the gas. We need to um, take that into account immediately because the gas changes that we need to like take it into account right away. Does that kind of sound right, Katie? Yeah, for sure. And then on um, art, I think like to kind of look in it for each, each like micro, do any adjustments in airflow. There isn't no direct airflow read, but that um, environmental bean temperature is feeling the effects of that change of airflow. So you do see in that uh, prediction line in the digital rows. Then on the larger scale, kind of piggybacking off what you said, Lisa, it's a conglomeration of all the data, you know, kind of being analyzed internally and then like re-put out there to be utilized as a whole. But for each individual roast, the prediction lines do take into um, effect the, the change of airflow has on the bean temperature and the environmental bean temperature for that bean temp per prediction line. Okay. So, let me let me quickly jump in that so that the question was like, I, I, I take two of those. Um, so the one was like, have we trained the, the algorithm on an idealized data set? Uh, well, we have trained it on many, many roasts. Um, and there's many that are not ideal. Um, I mean, that, that, that is, I'm not the judge for what is an ideal roast or not. But let, let's say it's like a different, different type of roast. Uh, of course, we I mean that there's some uh, uh, some exclusion of something that is not actually a roast. So we we did not. So if you would like to predict how your uh, re uh, heat up from from the roaster works, uh, it will not predict that correctly. So it's not trained on like I want to uh, see what my in between batch uh, protocol that that is not what it is. Uh, then we are back to the test. And it's like it is very very specific on, on the roasting process. Um, and the the other question there was like, does it predict the rate of fry crash? Um, it does not. I mean, except uh, Katie, <laughs> but well, maybe. Yeah. But it's like I, I I can say at the moment it does it does not. Um, there there's several reasons for that, um, but we are aware of that, and we are also working on on different methods. Uh, again, uh, a model that is like really good back to just what we said before, a model that is really good to predict an outcome um, in certain like specific cases, we need something else uh, and we need to, to really isolate those cases and look at them. But uh, it is an interesting and a very, uh, yeah, for us also interesting uh, topic that, that, that we are exploring and that we also put, put time in to understand. Um, okay, then I is there's a message from Ted. Uh, he says I've used a feature on about 20 roasts. It's very inaccurate for him on roasts that are not an even straight line. And even on those roasts, it looks like it's predicting a loss of power most of the time. How many cycles should I expect to go through for the program to start learning the curves I'm roasting? Um, so uh, Ted, you probably should reach out to <laughs> you should probably reach out to us uh, with. Uh, probably your log file so we can see from the roasting intelligence so we can see your machine type uh, and also tell us the PR number or the profile uh, you, you experience this on because actually uh, when you experience this on it should already be accurate at that time. Um, it could uh, Diedrich, uh, yeah, it could be that specific machine types or manufacturing years are not yet that accurate. We tried to have it on all machines, but it could be that it's not yet. Uh, and we're looking it into each case individually. So if you provide us uh, with your information, we're looking at each one. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think that yeah, in, in general, to add on, if you if you find something that you think is not reflecting accurately, um, we, we are very interested in those cases uh, to to better understand if there are, if there are some limitations um, that uh, that that we should be aware of. Because yeah, Lisa you... Martin, I added to the uh, to the chat. It's a Diedrich IR twelve that I'm using. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so basically the, the, the model itself alone, well, you would also probably need to know the year and then the profile you're roasting and then the PR, like the profile itself, you have this reference and then the PR. Because if we know that, we can try to simulate the same thing here and see exactly where and why it goes off and then look into that. So I, I think uh, shortly throwing in, I mean, uh, you can, I mean, the email address, I mean, or uh, Lisa, Lisa at crops .com. Yeah. Uh, that would be if you if you if you see something um, in, in that regard. And I mean, you can yeah, and, and and we take it from there. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same as we did with the slow. Like when we released it, we had the problem with the slow internet connections. We got a few reports, and like within a week, we were able to come up with an improvement. Um, we are we are always also learning with each release. So, if you send us the details, we will probably figure out the solution together. Okay, um, then we have this data set. Let's see, did I uh, overlook something? Ah, can you show a bean curve prediction video with the coffee approaching during first crack? Um, well, <laughs> Uh, at the moment, I can't because I only have the demo roast, but uh, I have a demo roast with my curve. Uh, I'm happy if you send us a, if you send me a message, I'm happy to make a recording for you. However, I don't have your machine, so I can't say how it will look for you. Um, yeah, you can also turn it on anytime when you're roasting because it doesn't like do anything. It just like shows you the prediction. It doesn't change anything what you're doing during roasting. Okay. If I miss this part, but does the algorithm only work if props tracks your gas changes electronically? I work on a roaster where we annotate each gas change that we make. We track it using the water column reading as opposed to gas percentage. Okay, so um, it still works for all the machines. It also works for machines that don't read out gas automatically. The updates are just not reflected as fast. So if you have an automatically gas readout, you can expect the, the, the change to be reflected within one second. If you don't have an uh, automatic gas readout, it takes a little bit longer, but maybe Katie, you can also add on that because you told us about your ancient sample roaster. <laughs> yeah, and also too with our roaster court, we don't have automatic uh, gas changes. We have a lever that goes from one to three. And so everything we roast recipes is through those tweaks. So as I'm roasting, say I need to increase the gas a little bit, I bump it up to two, I click two on our gas number on our Cropster program, and then within a minute or so, I see the effects of that kind of like laying out. And so our roaster is not automatically connected to Cropster in the sense that Cropster is instigating any of the changes. It's more so that I am doing the changes and then connecting them with Cropster, if that kind of makes sense. So because we do everything manual style rather than automatic style, um, it still um, really reflects what's going on there. And it will like kind of learn those and track them over time um, as this giant collaboration of data that this AI brain is getting through roasting. Um, so I don't think you explicitly have to have any like automatic features, any like crazy tech kind of old school low key over here. And we're able to see the benefits of using this AI system. Thank you. I hope this answers your question, Jason. Okay. Uh, will it be more beneficial for me to get a fidget rather than to use my machines built in crops to connection? Uh, I think this is referring to what Katie said. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if you use the fidget or the crops to connector, how we call it, uh, or the plug and play with an Ethernet cable. It's the same. There is, there is no difference. You don't need to change any equipment. Yeah, that's a bit, you don't need to necessarily change anything that you're doing. Crafter yeah. system is ready to like work with you. Oh, really cool going into the bed. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is really cool. That was our goal that you don't need to have the, the, 
yeah. yeah. The, the latest tech, but still using the latest tech. That is the goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, there, there's one question that I found, uh, and I think we did not touch upon it. It's like the can we put in integrated alarm points so that it may be used to give us a heads up to lower gas or raise airflow to keep in line with the reference curve. For example, right now, pre-crack and before end of the roast, we can set an alarm to go off, which is very useful for me while multitasking between packaging and burst. Should I? Do you want to? Um, well, <laughs> well <laughs> as, uh, as I fi finished off our webinar before, is that is just the starting point of what we do at the moment with artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, and basically very, very important to us now is like gather also all your feedback. Uh, so everything you encounter, all your ideas, please reach out to us anytime, uh, supportacrocster.com. You can always give us our feedback. We're always collecting it. And based on that, we're always iterating in what we can improve. And obviously, we also have some next things already in mind, uh, which kind of go in line with a few of these suggestions. But we need to see uh, what we can work out and implement, basically. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea. <laughs> Not maybe. Ah, OK. Well, that is a good one for you, Martin. Um, OK, does it learn off of everyone's roles now or just the people who signed up for the data project? Uh, well, it now learns from everyone. Um, so the data project was our initial step. And uh, we now expanded it uh, and, and have like a, a broader reach. Um, it is important to say that it is not including any personal or any general, I mean, it's like information. It's just like really for, for the, the machine, it's, it's a curve uh, or like some, some metadata, but uh, the machine, but it doesn't know anything about you or, or, or anything in particular. Uh, it also can, there's no way to, to go back to say like this prediction is because Katie Rose did it that way. So it's, it's, it's completely, it's, uh, it, it does not uh, keep track of anyone. Uh, it's, it's just like, it used this data set to, to build this model. Uh, and it, it will, and we, we will keep uh, improving it based on, on new data sets that we have. So it's not limited to this initial um, data, data set that we, we got it uh, in the data project, which at this point we had like, very uh, deep uh, relation. I mean, we, we have like uh, conversations with the customers and we very well knew what they sets went in to even understand. But that was like, because we had this conversation first and said like, let's, let's do this. And now we said like, it's completely abstracted uh, and it should not have any, any information from, from anyone. So it's very, it's an anonymized uh, data sets. Anonymized. So that's. I think that's the word spelled correctly. <laughs> okay. I hope this answers your question, Daniel. Okay, it does. Which is great. Um, okay. I don't know if we missed any other question. Uh, maybe we'll give it a few more minutes. If I missed or if we missed the question, please post it again because there were plenty of questions, um, and we'll answer it. Um, I think there were many really good questions already. And I'm really excited also to get like all the feedback from all of you when you're testing it. Um, we, are, we already got some cool screen recordings via Instagram. Also, you know, if you have something, you can always share it. Um, you can share it if you have a problem. You can share it if you like it. Like uh, with us, we are also happy if you write to support and be like, this is cool. Or if you write to support and like, I need help, all good for us. Yeah, You're so I, I think that uh, to, to uh, say that the best way to reach us uh, is, is support at, uh, because it depends. I, I first said Lisa, but it's probably not the best to, to reach out because it depends always on the, on the issue that we have. Uh, so if it's something specific to a machine, then we have like, we can directly go to, to our engineers. Uh, and, and data scientists. So um, please write to support that with, with any of your questions, suggestions, and uh, we, we will handle them from there. We will get back to you uh, and then uh, keep, you, keep you updated. Mm -hmm. 
and they're usually also very fast in responding, uh, faster than me when I'm, for example, in a webinar and can't respond. Um, <laughs> they're there monitoring our support and give you the help as fast as possible. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, I also think we're now reaching an hour, which I think is a really good time to, to wrap up. Um, well, then uh, I would say thank you. Thank you, Martin. Especially thank you, Katie, for taking time and sharing like all your experiences and feedback with us today. It's really, oh, yeah, really thanks great. for having me and inviting me and having us uh, should be a part of the beta testing. It's really fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. That's much, really Katie. cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, are, we are really happy to have you as part of our team and also to everybody else. Uh, we usually do this like, hey, you want to join us better testing in like our newsletters in our roast newsletters uh, where you can then reach out to us. Uh, but also like, hey, I also want to be part of Crops uh, better testing program. Write us an email, support at crops.com. Uh, and let us know and we will add you to the better testing program and reach out uh, when you qualify for some of it. Sometimes it's like machine related, uh, sometimes it's feature related, size related, whatever, but um, we are always happy uh, to incorporate our customers. Okay, then uh, I would say thank you very much. Uh, have a great evening, have a great morning, have a great everything uh, all around the world um, and speak to you soon. All right, yeah. In that sense. Bye, everyone. Thank you. And Bye. thanks again to Katie. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. <laughs>